welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Katie Hinman, and I'm the director of the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I'm delighted to welcome you here uh, for this screening of a new film that we have put together called Science is Mastery. And um, I do want to mention, because I know this, this session is overlapping two other sessions, and I think they gave me the entire time slot because the film is, is, you know, the film itself is almost half an hour and we want some time for discussion, but also, uh, if you want to go to a parallel session somewhere in here, that's okay too. Um, and, um, but what, uh, what my plan for this session is, I'm going to give you just a little bit of introduction and then show the film. And then I'd love to have some time for discussion afterwards. I can certainly answer some questions about the film. Um, but also, uh, I think that there might be uh, some opportunity for some fruitful discussion among us here in the room. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the layout. Um, as we begin today, I want to start with an acknowledgement of the land that we're gathering on. Um, so here on the U of T campus, we're on the ancestral homelands of the Huron-Wendat and the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I am coming to you from Washington, D.C., which is the ancestral homelands of the Piscataway and Nacotchtank or Anacostan peoples. I think land acknowledgments are a way that we can gratefully acknowledge the caretaking of people who lived on this land before us, as well as um, the many indigenous people who still live here today. And um, if you are interested in the land that you reside on, um, I would invite you to visit native-land.ca. It has a wonderful map for North America um, and, and shows what indigenous peoples call different areas home. So just a little bit of background uh, before I show the film. The American Association for the Advancement of Science is the world's largest general scientific society. We publish the science family of journals, but we also have an entire programmatic wing with the mission of advancing science and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all. And actually, this is an outdated slide because it says the benefit of all people. And we have recently dropped that last word from our mission statement to recognize that, in fact, it is not just people uh, that we want to benefit with the scientific enterprise. Um, and so the program that I am with, the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, is one of the ways that AAAS leads, lives out this mission. Um, our goal as Dozer is to foster dialogue between scientific and religious communities, recognizing that these often overlap, as they do here at ASA, um, on issues of science, technology, and society. We have a variety of programs that do that. Some of you may have heard my talk yesterday about our Science for Seminaries program that gives grants to seminaries to incorporate science engagement into theological education. Uh, we also work with uh, scientists and science organizations to help prepare them to be engaging with people of faith. We host workshops and panel discussions, and we create lots of wonderful resources. Um, and so one of those resources is what we're going to see today, but I just want to go ahead and give you the plug for visiting sciencereligiondialogue.org, where you can find all our film series. We have a wonderful series of profiles on scientists who engage with faith communities in different ways. Some of these are themselves people of faith. Um, some of them are just folks who are interested in that, as well as um, articles and event videos and project reports. Um, at the back of the room, there is a stack of these flyers. There's a set of flyers just about Dozer, but also a stack of these um, that uh, have links to the various film series that we created. Um, as part of the Science for Seminaries project, excuse me, I'm using the wrong scroller here. As part of our Science for Seminaries project, uh, one of the things that we did was create a series of video resources uh, for uh, seminary professors and others to use as kind of conversation starters on scientific topics. So the first of those series was our Science the Wide Angle series, which kind of looked at um, a variety of science topics that might come up or have relevance to faith communities from evolution to neuroscience to awe and wonder and cosmology. Um, and all of these are, are about five minute films that really are uh, made to kind of provide an opening and a discussion starter. 
And then our Who is Science um, series is featuring individual interviews with scientists um, because one of the things that we found in the work that we do is so much of this, uh, this work is benefited by relationships and humanization of folks that people may think that they are at, at odds with. So just understanding who's doing science, why are they excited about what they do, what inspires them, whether they are people of faith or not, what, what inspires them to the work that they do. So that's the Who is Science videos. And then we have um, two kind of more specifically topical series. One is um, on human evolution and development called Becoming Human. Again, these are about six or seven minute videos that kind of touch on some of the highlights about human evolution, why, um, why Homo sapiens won out uh, among other uh, hominid species and uh, what makes humanity unique. And then uh, our Humans and Race series, which is uh, talking about uh, race and racism and uh, the science, the way that science has contributed to that. And the film that we're going to show today is part of that series. And our goal when we started all this was, again, a, a, you know, five, five to eight minute videos and things like that. But as we were, um, you know, having these interviews and developing this series, uh, really getting into the history of science and the ways that it has contributed to racism, particularly within the United States, um, is such an important topic and one that you can't really get into in five minutes. So uh, hence the development of this film, Science is Mastery, which is um, a little bit less than a half hour. And it kind of traces the role of science in narratives about race. How has science contributed to our understanding of race, um, particularly in the U.S., and structures of racism um, in the U.S.? Um, and so it examines a lot of different scientific topics. It plays a little bit into some of the role of religion in this as well. Um, before I show it, I do want to mention this is a film about racism. So there are some disturbing pieces of content about uh, the slave trade, about the Holocaust, um, so that are part of this film. That is not the entire film, but just want to be aware of that. And so um, I kind of want to let the film speak for itself. And then when it's over, I'd be happy to entertain questions to the extent that I can answer them. But also, um, I think there's some really fruitful uh areas of discussion uh, that we might talk about. And I will note that this film is available on the Dozer website, and there is actually a discussion guide with it uh, that you can use in, in your context. Um, if you uh, like the film and are interested in you know, hosting a screening for something and would like more than is on the website or to have someone from Dozer uh, be part of that or something, please let us know because we're also happy to facilitate that. At this point in the session, Katie played the film Science's Mastery. To view this film, please use the QR code on the screen or visit scienceforligiondialogue.org. All right. Well, um, I hope you found that interesting and thought-provoking and perhaps a little discussion-provoking or question-provoking. Um, so I do want to have some time for, for questions and discussion. And again, I recognize there are other sessions going on. So if you need to sneak out, that is okay. Uh, I, w I do want to just, uh, this is a, uh, a heavy topic. And so I want to just remind us of a few community norms that uh, we should be respectful of one another, be professional, and be curious, ask questions um, of, of one another and ourselves uh, when we have discussions about this. I guess to start off with, does anybody have any kind of questions? I have some questions to start discussion, but I don't know if anybody had any kind of questions for us. It just seems to me this highlights who's interpreting the data mm -hmm. and making sure that we are a community of scientists that include diversity in a variety of ways that different voices are being heard. And I just think that kind of showed up several times throughout the movie. So that's just kind of comment. Yeah. I think it's such an important factor for us to think of. And, and 
to reckon with as scientists, as part of the scientific enterprise. I mean, part of this also uh, was was um, coupled with some work that uh, one of my Dozer colleagues, Dr. John Slattery, um, did looking at the history of AAAS as a society and the ways that AAAS has contributed in this, in particular, um, in eugenics and, uh, you know, science magazine articles about how great eugenics is, you know, um, and actually having these conversations about the history of the scientific enterprise and who has been involved in it and what voices have not been part of it, I think are so important. That was really interesting. Um, what I'm thinking about a little bit is at the end when they talked about the yay human genome project says we're all the same, but very quickly we move beyond that to profiling um, different communities. And I'm just thinking about the fact that we're sort of um, right now still in an intermediate stage between all of us having our whole genome sequenced, therefore being able to know specifically for me versus someone else what variants they might have that could play a role in for example, our response to different uh, drugs and that kind of things, because these some genetic differences have been quantified for that. So it seems to me, and it wasn't it wasn't very clear to me uh, in the film. Is this the kind of new racism um, growing out of the Human Genome Project that they're talking about? And um, so I'd like to maybe hear what you have to say about that. And and I'm just thinking about. Um, the idea that in this time where we do know there are important genetic variants that can affect, for instance, you know, all of these kinds of personalized genomic things, how we respond to chemotherapy and so on. Um, yeah, I'd just like to hear what the comments are about that. Yeah, I think one of the things, um, and, uh, you know, I really wish um, I, I would commend to you uh, the work of Augustin Fuentes and Joseph Graves, who are in here in particular on some of these issues. I think one of the things they were really talking about, about some kind of, uh, you know, the reemergence of racist science is the fact that with these sequences, we still often start from the categorization of these five, you know, the five races that we have talked about or, you know, of this idea that is linked to the social constructions of how we understand race. And so what you get is we're gonna look for differences with those as our starting categories, rather than having the data say, what are the, what are the meaningful, um, you know, the meaningful markers, the meaningful groups that help us understand, you know, are there groups that are more at risk for this, that, and the other, what is that related to? If you start with the idea that our starting point is we're categorizing people this way and then seeing what the differences are, you also, you know, not only do you perpetuate the idea that those categories are biologically based, but you also really run the risk of, of missing important factors because you've already decided these are the categories we're gonna use. And so I think that's really, you know, not quite as much as saying, you know, we can see differences and, and risk factors and things like that. It's if you start from the idea that we want to see based on race, how do these things spread up, then you're, you're, it's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. I uh, think so. Um, first, how, can you reiterate how I can access this for my students? Yes. If you go to sciencereligiondialogue.org, mm -hmm. you can even follow this lovely QR code. There's a, there's a set of these sheets. And um, this film, as well as there's two other films in, in this series, they, they are both uh, short films. Um, one kind of basic overview of humans and race and one about um, racism and racism in medicine featuring, featuring Deirdre Owens, who is in this film as well. So you can find them on the uh, on the website if you need a, a not streaming 
copy, let us know. And we can okay. So it doesn't need it. a subscription or anything? No, 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 no. Okay. It's just right there. And, and is there like a conversation guide that goes along with it for yeah. students? Yes, there is. Um, there is a short kind of conversation and discussion guide on there um, developed by Drew Rick Miller from Science for the Church. And I think they're also, he's also working on one that's like specifically for religious audiences. The one on the Dozer website is, is more general discussion questions and things like that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question for you or the room following up on what Heather says. It, it feels to me a little bit like a language problem. Does anyone have thoughts on what language you use so that you can robustly talk about the science, the genetic difference that is observed between individuals or some kind of groups, regardless of how you choose them, without making that language carry the historically dangerous value judgments that it has carried? That's a really wonderful question that I hope somebody would have some. Uh, Anybody have thoughts on that? And I'm not a geneticist. You're probably better at this. But um, usually we just talk about variants. Mm -hmm. So it has a variant in this or this variant in that area of the gene or that area of the gene or something like that. And that would be more of a common uh, vocabulary that wouldn't be real specific. I don't know if others have questions. Um, I have a couple of kind of questions for discussion. One, one is thinking about this specifically from the perspective of, you know, the ASA audience and, and scientists who are people of faith, you know, right at the beginning and, and what the kind of title of the film came from, this conversation about um, power and mastery and talking about how having the power and the ability to control humans and nature um, tempts you to do it. And, you know, that language of temptation, of course, is something that, that uh, as people of faith, we're, we're kind of uh, familiar with. And so I'm just kind of curious if y'all have thoughts about the role of scientists of faith, the role of religious communities and things like that in addressing this temptation uh, to control uh, through science and technology. The thing that makes me think of is just sort of addressing the myth of objectivity in mm. science, right? And being honest about how what we think shapes what we do as scientists, even if we're trying to be really objective. And so I think, um, yeah, as a social scientist, I talk to my students about whether I actually in one of my classes ask them, is science objective? And sometimes the natural science students have a really hard pro time with that question and, and sort of where I'm trying to push them. So I think it's important to be, to be honest about that. Yeah, thanks. I think um, the church has a long tradition of uh, public uh, confession and um, acts of repentance. And I've often wondered what it would look like for the church with scientists to publicly confess mm. and publicly repent. I'm not sure what it, how exactly that would look, but uh, and this is where I need my theology friends to help me out with those sorts of church practices. But um, I think something like that could be meaningful. I'm wondering um, about the difficulty that the scientific community has with conveying the results, genomic results, to a non-scientific audience. Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine here this message is, there are no differences. You know, and a lay audience will say, well, wait a minute, I can see them. Mm -hmm. How come you're saying there are no differences when I can see them? How can I believe you? There's a credibility issue there. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end, I for forgot who the speaker was. Someone says, well, the, there are differences. Okay, but they're not the important ones. Uh, I mean, he didn't say it quite that way, but he basically said, yes, there are differences that are found. He said that in one little brief. Mm -hmm. But then it raises the questions as, okay, so who determined which differences make a difference? Mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I think there's a bit of a communication problem because you have a skeptical public it's looking at this is why are you telling me I can't believe my own eyes? Mm -hmm. How do we get around that? And that is a that is a real difficult challenge. And talking about the fact that, you know, as 
as um, Augustine Ponce has said, you know, race is real. It's not biological, right? It's not, you know, and but that raises some of the same issues. You know, when you think, well, um, skin color is part of biology or whatever. You know, what what does that mean, and and where how do we understand that? And I think. You know, that's that's long kind of been a bit of a failure of our language of how how do we talk about differences and categories in ways that are meaningful, but also honest about what they incorporate and what they don't. Um, And I think that's, you know, race in, you know, in our society doesn't just incorporate skin color or things like that. It incorporates all of these other social and cultural norms that have nothing to do with biology. But we then say, oh, well, if, you know, if skin color is a biological trait and we have linked this now to all of these social and cultural traits, then that means biologically these things are inherent in this group of people or this group of people. And, you know, how do we separate out those, those concepts? And it's, yeah, it's really difficult. I don't have an answer, I'm afraid. Uh, in answer to the question of the person who asked the previous question, what can the church do? In Canada, we've had, res- I don't know whether the Americans have heard this, we have a lot of issues to deal with in terms of residential schools and how indigenous people, and the churches are beginning to reach out, and the government is trying to reach out, and I think in some ways it's having some success. I, I had one other question, though. Um, in so much ways, in so many ways, um, the kind of research that gets done is dependent on the money available. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if in any way um, people out that want to come up with the fact that there are good reasons for races and have the money to prove it, I'm wondering if that does affect what kind of research gets done. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I think that there, you know, definitely this plays into the question of power and power structures and what you know, money is, is part of that and, and uh, research direction and things like that. I think there is also, I'm, I'm just thinking about this idea of public repentance. You know, one of the things that, uh, that the scientific community, I think, really struggles with is that sort of thing, that kind of reckoning with history. Um, you know, even AAAS, we've done a little bit of it, but we're not really great at it, you know, published a couple of editorials in Science Magazine being like, yeah, okay, we we had this role, but what does that actually mean moving forward? And, you know, I think maybe part of that has to do with the goal of science to always be moving forward, right? We don't want to, you know, we're just developing and we're, we're past that now. And like, that doesn't work to just be past so um, I'm thinking about like how could the scientific community learn from the religious community in that. Okay. I'm trying to formulate this question, but I'm thinking about this idea of you know scientists coming out repenting for things that have gone on in the past and how that relates to the kind of the push, especially in the United States, for science to be more involved in public policy. Mm. And especially coming right out of the pandemic, where it seems like there was a lot of debate over the science behind the vaccines and things like that, to the point that, you know, people in my community were putting yard signs out that said, among other things, science is real on them. Um, I don't know if they would think this science is real. I don't think so. But but how do you parse between that when, you know, there is this uncertainty and there's times when scientists get things wrong, but yet on the other hand, we want a science-driven public policy um, in our country and coming out and saying things like scientists were wrong in the past about this, how is do we do that in a way that maintains credibility and doesn't feed 
people who want to say, well, you know, if science is wrong then, then it's wrong now and all of that. That's a really good question. I love to hear if others have kind of thoughts about that. You know, one thing that that kind of does uh, come to mind on that is our failure kind of generally to educate people on how science works and the fact that getting things wrong and and improving on ideas is the whole thing of science, but also recognizing that, you know, as they mentioned, when we get it wrong, people die. They had real consequences. Um, you know, on, on a personal level, I think there is actually value in, in that level of humility of, of saying that, you know, we don't always get things right, but we're always working towards getting better on them. But I think that is a real issue, and I don't, I don't know if others have thoughts on that. In the United States, it's, it just seems like there's been a real rise in the uh, politicization of discussions of race and racism, uh, sort of uh, dismissing it as being woke, mm -hmm. a term that I just have come to hate. Um, have you had any pushback on this presentation is somehow being woke ideology and kind of trying to diminish it in some way? Not yet, uh, but that may be that uh, we haven't uh, distributed it widely enough yet um, for that to happen. So, so, so uh, Katie, this was a dozer project, is mm -hmm. that correct? So yeah. I'm, I'm just um, wondering I think it's great, but what are your distribution plans? What Are you just throwing it out and seeing who picks it up? Or do you have a specific program laid out as to how you're going to distribute it and how are you going to, to really uh, leverage it? Uh, yeah, we're working on some of that now. Unfortunately, like this was produced right towards the end of the Science for Seminaries project. So unfortunately, the funding from that project is not still there for kind of promotion. But was so, this part of that? You mean? Yeah, the 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 film itself was part of the Science for Seminaries project. Oh, really? Developed oh, that. I didn't catch that. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're thinking about is, you know, how we are distributing it and promoting it among the network of schools that we have worked with and things like that, as well as, you know, showing it um, in, we've, we've shown it at several scientific society meetings, AAAS, uh, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists and a couple other um, scientific society meetings, um, hopefully going to be showing it at the American, uh, Academ is it American Academy of Religion, AAR? Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, thinking about where are places where this, uh, you know, could really have an impact, we would we would love, uh, you know, folks' thoughts on that, and and where are, um, more places that that uh, that we can use it. We're talking within with other AAAS programs as well about that, um, including our ICED program, which is you know focused on um, on DEIA work and things like that. Uh, when you submit your sample of your DNA to uh, 23andMe, they'll come back and give you your cultural and racial backgrounds. Uh, does this present any problems for you convincing people otherwise? <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting question, and I wish I could kind of remember the, the um, there was a panel at the AAAS meeting um, that both Augustin Fuentes and Joseph Graves were on where they talked a lot about that and about, you know, how that is not actually helpful or meaningful uh, to a large extent. Um, the ways that, and again, this has to do with how do we categorize those groups of DNA? How do we decide that this is the, the ancestral category that we are going to try to map people onto? Um, and is that meaningful in terms of thinking about things like health impacts or, or genetic risks or things like that? Are those actually the meaningful categories? And probably not. Um, you know, so it's this, it, it's interesting though, because I think, you know, the flip side of that is when people get results they're not expecting, 
that challenge their ideas of what these different groups mean, then that can also have a really powerful effect um, of, of having people kind of question, you know, like, I, I thought I was this, and now I, I may be this, and what does that actually mean? But biologically, those categories aren't necessarily meaningful and helpful from that perspective. So, uh, so in the sciences mastery is part of the humans and race series. So there's three there's three films in that series. So if you go to humans and race, sciences mastery is one of those. If you go to the science religion dialogue homepage, it's like the second thing that shows up in the slideshow at the top. So. Completely unrelated to this, but just in case you're interested in climate change, uh, we have a project uh, where we are giving grants to seminaries uh, to incorporate climate science into the, their uh, coursework and education and preparation of future ministers. And that's open right now. So I've got a flyer for that. Thank you.